Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to speak to you today in this important IPRED conference. As uh, Professor Oren said, my name is Yuval Diskin, and I serve the State of Israel for conference. Important IPRED said, my name is Yuval Diskin, and I serve the State of Israel for conference. Important IPRED said, my name is Yuval as Shin Bet or Shabak. In 2005, I was nominated by the government, which was headed by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon as director of ISA. <clears throat> I served as, a, as director under Prime Minister Olmert and then under Prime Minister Netanyahu. I retired in May 2011 and I have founded together with good friends, a cybersecurity company working mostly in Europe in improving global cooperation's protection against cyber threats by special method of assessment and tailor-made mitigation and cybersecurity solutions. <coughs> in the next 20 minutes, I will try to convince you that we already live in a very challenging uh, age, that is the cyber age. I will start with the bad news, but I promise also to bring the good news at the end. My vision of the cyber age is that of an age where almost all systems are embedded with computers which are part of computer networks and communicate mostly with other computers and networks. In this cyber age, the amount of connections between co computers is unperceivable. In this cyber age, our growing dependency on these computers and their communications is an irreversible process. That cyber age is now. As we speak, more and more aspects of our daily lives are being run from more and more portable computers. So it will not come to you as a surprise that there are hundreds of millions of portable computers from smartphones to tablets and even laptops. Data shows that 2011 was the first year where more smartphones have been sold than computers. Usage level of those devices is rising exponentially while the security of these computers remains fairly low if existent. Of course, when tens of millions of employees all over the world are using smartphones, it is only natural they would like to use the same device to run both their personal lives and their business life. This BYOD, or bring your own device trend, poses a more significant challenge to organizations, seeking to create balance between effectiveness and security. We live in a world where the national critical infrastructure, such as electricity, water, refineries, dams, chemical plants, nuclear reactors, or large industrial plants, are controlled by computerized industrial control systems, some of which are very old, all connected naturally to the internet or to other communication networks. These systems are virtually not defended with the respect to their sensitivity and importance. We live in a world where the cars we make are computer embedded, not to mention planes, ships, trains, and more. Most of all, we live in a world where the gap between a defender's ability and an attacker's ability is still too wide. This gap must be narrowed, and the sooner, the better. I would like to demonstrate this to you with a dramatic event that occurred just over 12 years ago, the terror attacks of 9-11. My friend Robert Mueller, the retired director of the FBI, described in a conference in San Francisco about two years ago how the world has changed drastically due to those attacks. Now, I want to present to you those events, but from a different perspective. I would like to compare between the perceptions, and I emphasize again the word perceptions, that existed before the 9-11 to the current days of the cyber age. 
Imagine whether anyone before 9-11 would have conceived possible the launch of two guided missiles toward the Twin Towers and another one directed at the Pentagon. We can assume that if anyone would have come up with this theory, people would claim he, that he was disturbed, delusional, or a hopeless pessimist. At that time, no one was looking at the bigger picture. Now, let's take a moment to remember what happened 12 years ago. 19 suicidal terrorists, carefully trained for a long period of time, took over four jets filled with fuel, which they turned to human-guided missiles crashing at the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. This mega-terror attack was one of enormous complexity and took years of planning and training. Now, let us try to describe the operational idea behind the 9-11 attacks in more abstract terms. It was an abuse of modern civilian technology, turning it into a most effective weapon to create the biggest terror attack in human history. Using those same ideas, we can see how things are becoming much simpler in our cyber age. In this minute, in the other side of the world, a group of hackers could be planning an attack. Whether they are in the service of a terror organization, or an organized crime organization, or the service of a state, they can disrupt with no special difficulty and surely with no personal risk the traffic light system in a certain city across the world partially paralyze the electric infrastructure, take down a cellular network of one network supplier and cause an explosion in a chemical plant just outside the same highly populated city. Just try to imagine the chaos it will create. The efforts required to do that are dwarfed to zero in respect to the efforts taken by Al-Qaeda to carry out the attacks of 9-11. There, no, there are other even more diabolical scenarios, but I wouldn't want to provide anyone with ideas. However, I am confident that we must not bury our heads in the sand claiming, if it is so easy, why hasn't it already happened? So here, I would like to remind you, once again, the atmosphere and the perceptions leading to the attacks of 9-11, described meticulously by the 9-11 Commission report, and I quote from a testimony given by a CIA officer to the committee. No analytic work being done at that time also the lightning which could connect the thundercloud of events and information to the ground. Now, after I hopefully frightened all of you enough, I can jump to the good news. I may surprise some of you if I would tell you that most of the methods applied by hackers were not invented in the 21st century. Methods such as pre-operation intelligence gathering, identity theft, impersonation, undercover work, man in the middle, fraud, leaking collected information, identifying weaknesses and exploiting them, and many others are all methods used by spies, terrorists, and criminals since the beginning of time. The major change in the cyber age is the complexity of the cybernetic medium in which these actions take place. Therefore, as much as I am convinced that terrorist attacks can be prevented, so can cyber attacks. For that to happen, we need deep understanding in the motivation and the ways of thinking of an attacker, combined with a deep understanding of the technology of this cybernetic medium. We can develop technologies which will predict possible points of failure and enable allocating more computerized and human resources to these problems. We can develop technologies that will identify some attacks before reaching their targets. We can improve our means of command and control on our computer networks. We can predict cyber attacks in the early stages and contain them. We can deceive attackers and fraud them. 
We can scatter baits and honeypots. With time, I believe we can develop the technological and legislative tools which will allow us to deter such an attacks. But in order to succeed, we have to understand that cybersecurity is based on multidisciplinary approach. One of the fundamental weaknesses of the classic information security, information security, not cybersecurity, is its linear approach, which makes the wrong assumption that if the organization follows all the security standards, rules, and regulations, a attacker will be unable to penetrate its system. Well, life is tough, and this assumption is wrong. The new cybersecurity approach is fundamentally not linear and assumes that the complexity and the interconnectivity between information systems, engineering systems, communication systems, the human resource factor, and all other interfaces means that it is impossible to treat information security as an independent discipline. Taking this into consideration, cybersecurity requires a multidisciplinary approach, including deep expertise in physical security, deep understanding of, of telecom systems, expertise in classic information security, deep understandings of the human factor, including psychological aspects of the classic espionage world, comprehension of how attackers gather information, and deep understandings of the entire business processes or lines of business. And yet, much like there is no hermetic solution to terrorism, there will be no hermetic solution to every threat in the cybernetic medium. Even so, by diverting resources and national attentions to the matter, things can get a whole lot better. In recent years, a new term was going ethical hackers, <clears throat> some of them are even certified ethical hackers. I mean to say that there are bad hackers and there are good hackers. I believe he lays another key, and maybe even a principal one, to closing the gap between the bad guys and the good guys. Much knowledge has amassed with cyber experts who are able to better analyze methods used by attackers. They are not ones found within defense forces of many states in the world, much like in the state of Israel, which has been blessed with extraordinary talents. However, only a small portion of them civilianizes their knowledge for the purpose of defending the civilian systems. I believe that the dramatic increase in threat demands a need for state and economic encouragement of massive influx of experts previously from the defense forces to the high-tech industry to develop civilian defense solutions. If that shall happen, I believe the currently existing gap between defenders and attackers in favor of the attacker will balance out in the next years. With these optimistic words, I will conclude. I would like to thank you again for inviting me to speak to you today. Thank you very much.